Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. It's always so hard to stay awake after butter chicken and naan. But uh, we have exciting panels lined up for us this afternoon. So, um, so let's, let's get started. So our first panel, um, Measuring Matter, Testing and Assessment in Pre-K to Gray. Uh, this, this, the topic of this is obviously uh, tests and their efficacy, and this has become a contentious topic and sometimes a very polarizing discussion. And here to give us a glimpse into what's happening in the testing world are a group of leaders from the industry. Um, so I'd like to welcome up our moderator, Ellen Desmarais, Executive Vice President, Harvard Business Publishing, Akash Chaudhary, Managing Director of Akash Educational Services, Anil Nagar, Co-Founder and CEO of ADA247, Amit Sevak, President and CEO of ETS, Jennifer Dewar, Senior Director of Strategic en Engagement Duolingo, and Ratnesh Jha, CEO of Burlington English. Please welcome our speakers. And good afternoon. We got the dreaded after lunch slot. So we're going to try and make this interesting and try and keep it energizing. And I think we have some really different perspectives on what testing assessment means in this day and age and where this entire industry is actually going. Um, and one of the things we talked about when we were prepping for this panel is we thought we were one of the most important panels in all of GSV because we're hearing a lot about what needs to change and how it needs to change. But this is the group that actually is representing the measurement of those outcomes. Is that change actually happening? So one of the things we want to start with right away is I think even the name of this panel, uh, testing and assessment in pre-K to gray. And I want to ask some of my panelists to comment on that definition of audience. And are you really serving pre-K to gray today versus what you may think this may be going in tomorrow? Um, and I do want to acknowledge with that we have obviously lost a panel member. Uh, Akash could not be with us today. And we kindly have had Rohit swap in for Amit of ETS. So I'm Rohit, I might give you the first shot at this. You work, represent workplace development efforts for ETS. Pre-K to Gray, who do you serve and where do you think this is going to be tomorrow? Great, no, thank you. Um, so ETS uh, uh, historically has served in the K-12 and the higher ed space. Uh, we do do some work in the workforce development space, but definitely as we look at the future, not just the future of assessments within K-12 to uh, higher ed, but also looking at how do we expand beyond our core segments that we serve. And so uh, definitely, as, as you mentioned, uh, I just joined ETS four months back, and a key focus for us is the workforce. Uh, looking at skills, skills becoming the currency for upward mobility, for mobility between one organization and the other, and that's going to be a big focus area for us. And Anil, maybe you would like to comment on this. You brought this up on our panel, I recall. Yeah, sure. So uh, at Adder 247, we cater to higher ed primarily, and uh, uh, so basically we help students uh, in terms of preparing for various exams, and these are uh, exams for various jobs or uh, admission tests. And, uh, and what, what we have seen is uh, that uh, uh, in terms of getting the job or admission in a college, uh, specific, specific test prep preparation, uh, it's, it's slightly different as compared to what it is might be doing, but it's, uh, it's very standardized and uh, it's like, masses, uh, so millions of people will appear for the test and few thousands will get through. So it's very, I will say, a hyper competitive uh, segment. But yeah, uh, I think assessment is the key there in terms of selection. So I think it's interesting with this understanding of gray, right, and then connecting that with workplace development and skill focus, right? Well, this is kind of the connection to this l ambition for lifelong learning we're all talking about and maybe we're still dreaming about. And I think that was one of the things that interests me, the point about gray, right? That's a sector that we haven't really talked as much about today. 
So I'm curious, maybe all of you represent kind of change agents in different ways that you're playing in the testing and assessment industry. Do you think change will happen quickly in this space, or should investors and other participants take a longer-term point of view on what this means? Maybe Ratnesh, you'd like to respond. Uh, thanks. Uh, I think uh, before I answer your question, I think uh, uh, Burlington truly is the pre-K to gray. Uh, we do uh, the early childhood to, 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 to the K through 12, uh, higher education, employability, or we're also there on the prep side. Uh, I think the uh, interesting dimension which we're seeing in the last couple of days of discussions is around the fact that the learning itself, uh, the knowledge itself, is something which is not the theme. Uh, I think what is really becoming theme is the competency, right? So, and, and clearly uh, uh, why assessment becomes very important is that it's no more an assessment of a discrete output which we are looking at. We are looking in terms of more of a choice-based uh, discussion. So I think uh, if you to notice Harry Potter, Dumbledore saying in the Chamber of Secret to Harry Potter, uh, saying that if you to look at uh, uh, making a choice, the, the decision between a choice and uh, the knowledge, the choice is the future. I think clearly the investors community, the, the, the education educators, and also the government lately, uh, the policy makers are actually doing a lot in terms of ensuring that assessment becomes the part of that choice making and therefore enables the ecosystem. So clearly your answer, question to your answer is, I think it's a very important theme and is one of the most important theme in a changing time in 21st century. And to that point about change that's happening, this also seems like we're at a moment where people are also really t discussing if the paradigm of how we assess needs to start changing, right? We are all part of kind of products of a high stakes standardized assessment world. I mean, let me actually, for the sake of the panel, show of hands from the audience, because I want to see who's awake. How many of you had to take a standardized assessment test at some point in your K-12 schooling? Okay. How many had to take a standardized high stakes test in order to get into university? Very similar numbers. And how many of you have ever had to take an assessment for a job or some sort of workplace development? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting world we're all living in. Uh, because one of my questions is who is all of that testing actually serving? I'm really curious to hear how that, this panel thinks about it. And Jen, I may throw this to you first, because I think this is one of the questions that's underpinning this, if anything, expansion of testing and assessment. Are we doing right by the learners in this equation? Or is this for the sake of the universities, the governments, the employers? Who is benefiting from all this testing? Yeah, um, before I joined Duolingo about five years ago, I spent almost two decades in university recruitment and admissions, and so I was a user of admissions tests for many years. Um, specifically here in India, I was responsible for India, and I can say, I, I listened to Amit's keynote yesterday about having more standardized assessments throughout India, and my perspective as a former admissions officer is that it's really important to have standardized testing in a place like India, those of you who grew up here will know, you know, there's national board exams like the ISC and the CBSE, and then there's dozens of state exams and local exams. And for students who are applying outside of India, it's really hard for universities to assess them all in a standardized way with different kinds of scales. And, and same with the United States, like international baccalaureate, advanced placement. Everybody comes looking so different. And one thing that is the same are these standardized tests. And so I'm not... I'm not fully on board with standardized tests in every single way because I think they can be misinterpreted and I think we have to look at them with a lens and context of understanding that there is a relationship between socioeconomic means and success on standardized tests. But if you keep that in mind, standardized tests are actually a way that people who may be taking a state board exam in UP have the opportunity to compete with students who are doing a CBSE here in Delhi. Can I add to this? Yeah, that'd be great. You know, I think the uh, the fact that she's mentioning about India being a duolingo, the fact that you know the kind of assessment which we see in India, and also in Asia, for example, to give you Indian context, CBSC is a primary board. They do what 38 million uh, tests. Uh, you know, between both the, uh, 
the ETS and the IELTS, which is a large, uh, about uh, three million each, uh, you know, and, and if you look at age in other country like China, they do about similar 38 to 40 million gao kao test, which is a summative test for them, high stake test for them. I think the important part which we see as it is emerging in Asia, this part of the world, is that how do you really balance between the quality and the equity side? And I think that's a very important theme. Uh, since you mentioned India, and since you're mentioning Asia, uh, that how do you really continue to deliver quality while keeping the equity at play? So, and I think that's when the choice becomes a very important discussion. Yeah, and you know, one of the things um, uh, we've all seen in the last couple of years, assessment has become a bit of a dirty word. And I, I'd like to just challenge that. It has its limitations, uh, but every time uh, we are interacting with even one another, implicitly, you know, you are assessing another person on a different dimension. And so interview being a classic case of a form of assessment, that you could argue is very subjective. And standardized tests do play a role, I think, but they also need to evolve. And to your question around the fact that is it going to be a long haul or, or is it going to change overnight? And obviously the answer is it depends in my view. I think some, some areas, especially as we think about the workforce where employers are the decision makers in that case, they would probably change much faster, wanting to make sure they're bringing the right talent into the organization and being able to measure the, uh, the quality of that talent in an objective manner. Uh, if we look at the other parts of the whole value chain in the education setup, especially higher education and even going into K-12, I think it'll be a, a slow change. There is uh, both um, social, societal context that is at play, and, and in many cases there may be also political pressures are changing. And, and we have to remember that, you know, the whole education system is built on a certain framework, so it's hard-coded in so many ecosystems, just the unit of credit, if we just think about that. Um, if you challenge that, which is the notion of seed time, is seed time equal to learning, if we decide to change that, imagine the amount of change that needs to happen around the world from education, the SISs, the LMSs that are all configured around that, and in many cases, um, uh, instructors and professors who are paid according to that. So I think we need to challenge that, but also find practical solutions as alternative and not just throw, uh, throw, throw out the problem. And Anil, yeah. would you like to comment so, on this? Yeah, so when we think of India, uh, and we talk of test prep in context of India, I think is it is uh, slightly different from uh, international uh, perspective. So in India, uh, it's a country of exams. Uh, for example, we cater to a segment where a government is doing hiring and they will conduct certain exam before that. Uh, that's the only criteria they will have to give a job to anybody in a, uh, in a government uh, setup. And uh, as of now, they conduct around 500 exams in a year. And the condition is that, uh, let's say there are 100 jobs, the applicant will be at least 100 times of that. And sometimes it goes up to 1,000 times. And the whole idea of test prep uh, and let's say testing in, in this kind of uh, setup is to provide the fairness and a level playing field to everyone. But uh, if we look at the way in which these exams are being conducted. A lot of these exams out of these 500 are still pen paper exams. And even beyond that, even if their exam, some exams are online, these are also being conducted in physical uh, offli offline uh, centers where there is a computer lab kind of setup. So I, I think a lot of uh, things have to change in context of India if you really want to think uh, assessment as a way uh, for hiring or giving admission to uh, to students in colleges and universities. And uh, I think this is the uh, next step where we want to say that these tests can be personalized or let's say there can be uh, AI-based uh, tests where you can uh, probably choose the right uh, talent. But as of now, I think we have a long way to go. I, I feel uh, uh, it will take some time for us. So you were the first to say AI. On this panel, I clocked it. We're 13 <laughs> minutes in. This is my new game. How fast does it take for anybody to say AI or chat GBT in a conversation these days? But so you brought it up. So let's go there because 
Um, I recently read from Holon IQ that they said the two sectors of education that should actually be the most impacted by AI are language learning and testing and assessment. Holon IQ's perspective was why that would happen is because these were the sectors at which the greatest improvement in customer outcomes can be achieved by AI, by that AI, as well as a reduction in cost. Um, Jen, given you represent both of those in some respects, I'd love for you to open. Like, what is your take on what AI has an opportunity to do in this segment? Yeah, I think one of the things that Duolingo did well was we made a bet on AI and assessment early. So before COVID-19, we launched the Duolingo English test in 2016. We felt like there was an opportunity to make a more accessible, more affordable test, uh, use computer adaptive testing to make it more personalized. And we've been doing this for a long time now. Um, and it really took off during the pandemic. Um, to investors, it still takes time, even if it grows really fast overnight. Um, it's a pretty complex two-sided market, as my fellow panelists have been explaining, but it's not, it's more complex, the assessment business, I think, than the language learning business in many ways, because it is a dual-sided market. Um, but in terms of AI, for us, it's, it's we, the, the Duolingo English test was born digital, and so we've only imagined it to be a test that's powered by AI, and it, we think, um, and we continue to evolve as AI evolves with the test, but we think that it both uh, reinforces the validity of the test. Uh, we've been able to use AI, especially in interactional competencies, to make the test a better test for test takers and for users of tests, like universities, and we've used AI to make the test more secure. I will say, though, there needs to be a human in the loop. I don't have a cautionary tale about this because we've had a human in the loop all the time, but we should talk about AI is a terrific tool for humans. Um, and so even when we're making new a items using AI, we still have humans doing fairness and bias reviews. When we're using AI for security, we're having the AI run through a battery of all kinds of things from key keystroke analysis to eye tracking, but that's giving information to our human proctors. And so it can't be AI alone. It's not gonna replace humans who are involved in the creation and security of a test. Do you want to comment? So, Alan, I'm, 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 I operate in both in the language and the testing space, and I think uh, clearly AI uh, is uh, very empowering uh, for uh, uh, organizations such as ours because we already see ourselves starting at a space which we have taken into consideration AI being part of the uh, uh, part of our platform and solution. Uh, but the more important question than in the context of India, I would actually like to play back here in Asia, because a large part of testing which ETS and Duolingo does is really comes out of this part of the world, is, is when you make that AI engines to make choice, uh, the diversity and including that diversity to get that whole equity element plays a very important role. And when I say diversity, you have a standardized test for a particular country. For, let's just take example of scale. Uh, 80 million people in Germany, uh, they do about, they about, uh, uh, they're about uh, 60, 70 university, uh, give and take about 19,000 courses. That itself is a, too much of diversity. Imagine that taking back in India, 1.2 million people, 256, and we do a, about 1.3 million school, nine, 90 million teach, uh, 9 million teachers in the school space itself. And then the panel earlier were talking about that every few kilometers you go, language changes. To build that choice as part of your, and train AI to make a right decision is going to have, we have seen some disaster happening because of the data not being uh, taken rightly. So I think it's important as an organization such as ours to make that choice very well and make, get it embedded. And I think we're doing truly well. Uh, we, we impact many teachers in this part of the world and making sure that we do it in a way that it empowers the teachers, students, and also the lifelong learners is very, very critical. If I can add to that, I think um, definitely, you know, it, it is the buzzword. Um, so uh, no conversation will be over before using the word AI, but I think we also need to look at, you mentioned about the human intervention, and if we look at um, university admissions as an example, um, uh, perhaps uh, what we saw was both pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, obviously everything was thrown in a loop, but pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, the number of institutions that continue to recognize you know, our, our assessments as an example, you know, continue to be the same or even increased. And that points to the reliability, validity that you brought, uh, that you talked about, Jen, here. Of course, AI is going to become increasingly important as we think about 
Even if you take the test, uh, the English, you know, all of us are in the English business in some form or fashion, and can, can AI be used to contextualize, still measure one of the skills, whether it's, it's reading, whether it's writing, whether it's uh, uh, speaking uh, uh, or listening, can you contextualize it for the test taker? So, you know, you may be getting a question even in a, in a cognitive uh, skills like GRE around, let's say, uh, quantitative analysis based on a baseball game in the US to a student. And if the same question is turned around and asked in a cricket context to a student in India, it doesn't mean that they, you know, the skill level can still be measured uh, from an equity and fairness perspective, but the person has a better contextual understanding of the subject. And I think that's where we believe there's an opportunity of how AI can help contextualize while measuring the same skill that you think about. Yeah, so I will agree with Ratnesh. Uh, so in our context, the biggest challenge we see is the language challenge because uh, in India, like every state will have a different language, uh, most of the states. Like, uh, so for example, when we think of assessment or testing in our company, uh, language becomes a big, something uh, big for us. So for example, if we are uh, taking care of uh, somebody in uh, Tamil Nadu, so assessment has to be driven in Tamil language. So when it comes to AI, so it has to be seen how effective AI is going to work in different languages. But I think the bigger role AI can play is uh, on the other side. When we say that our colleges, our universities, our school, they, uh, and they are, let's say, providing certain education, uh, how to measure that effectiveness, how to uh, uh, give direction to any learner. Uh, for example, let's say we are assessing anybody in a school setup, and we want to know whether our education, whatever we provided, it was effective or not. And based on this, uh, what is the direction we want to give to any child? We want to, for example, we want to tell that, okay, uh, based on whatever you are doing, your interest, where you are excelling, this is the career probably you can choose. So currently, I think this is completely missing in our ecosystem in India. Though I, I feel government is uh, trying to uh, uh, do uh, things at their level. So they have introduced assessment at school level at uh, various standards. But I think uh, AI is going to play a big role while, uh, at least in a school kind of ecosystem, where uh, uh, we can understand a child better and we can guide a student and give a certain direction in terms of his or own career. That's a great point. And um, I wanted to go back to the point, Ratnash, you had used the word equity, which feels like it's also a very critical and heated debate right now of what are we doing to improve access and inclusivity uh, you know, for these test takers. And one of the interesting things as we talk about testing as assessment, there are both the standardized testing companies like an ETS, but then there are also the test prep players, right? And people are, there's opportunities to make money on both sides of these equations, but there's also an opportunity to drive change from each side of this equation. So kind of curious to hear from these different points of view, whose responsibility is it to improve the equity of testing? A very interesting question, uh, Ellen, and I think, uh, Clearly, the world uh, sometimes seems divided. Uh, when you one side of the world, we North America, people are talking high stake testing, whether it is relevant or not, right? Should we be looking at competency? Uh, in our part of the world, knowledge competency along with the testing is becoming very important. And I think, uh, to Anil's your point, uh, I think the quality and equity cannot really be divided for a long time now. I think as we trying to get the people from poverty out in this part of the world, and as Michael was sharing that if India is the decade and the century, uh, it is important for us to realize the power of that bandwidth now in the hand of, uh, of those people across the country. So how we as a, you know, players changing our own approach and making sure those testing gets to that platform or the, you know, on, on that particular handset to be able to make it very, very applied once. We saw some example in the morning about the speaking of language and therefore, uh, I think clearly it is our responsibility. It is a responsibility of government. It is a responsibility of private sector. We cannot say that 3 million is, or 18 million is the end of the world. We're talking 258 million people in the learning space. Combine that with other countries in Asia, uh, and Asian countries, that's a, that's a huge number, and our responsibility, collective responsibility, to be able to imagine that equity and a pricing 
and in a way that we can reach out to these people and make sure that we make it very inclusive. Uh, so I think it is our collective responsibility, it is our responsibility to make that change, and therefore we can make that decade and century of ours uh, of, for India. And I think Duolingo is doing a great job in terms of ensuring uh, that those proctored and things are accessible and, and people are actually using it. It's clearly, we as a VTest doing a very good job in terms of reaching out the teachers and making sure that that really builds the capacity. Yeah, and I'm picking up, you know, Anil, you were saying before, so many of the tests are still happening in paper and pencil, right? We're all enthused about AI, but we still have to conquer the fact that the majority of these tests taken around the world are still hard copy. And Jen, you were making kind of the point, I think when we were having some earlier discussions about the role of mobile potentially in all of this. And I think particularly when we talk about India as a market and the opportunity to increase access, what role does potentially just mobile as a modality have to play in this? Yeah, the Duolingo English test is not yet mobile. The learning app is, um, we're still not there with security to be able to deliver the Duolingo English test on mobile. Um, but just having a digital test that needs to be taken on a laptop or a desktop, I think has really opened up um, a channel or a new profile of students in India who didn't have access to test centers before. Um, so for example, last year, 60% of our test takers were from the 10 most populous cities in India, uh, t test takers in India, and the other 40% were from the rest of the country. And if you look at the numbers of Indian students applying to especially graduate programs, one or two year master's programs in data science and engineering, the U.S. Council of Graduate Schools announced that many of those programs are experiencing year over year double and triple percentage increases from India specifically. And we're seeing that. We're seeing students sharing to those kinds of programs. That's where they're sending their Duolingo English test scores. And I hypothesize that those students weren't even participating in high stakes assessments before this. Um, and so certainly digital testing has opened up a channel Mobile testing, I think, will be even more transformative when, when we get to being able to do that. And I, I like the fact we have ETS and Duolingo sitting next to each other on this panel. <laughs> that was on we had an interesting conversation. Are you, are you enemies? Are you competitors? Are you frenemies? Like how, this is a really interesting example too of how disruption in what has been considered very state industry is you know, Duolingo's position on this is actually a really novel approach to disrupting an industry. So curious if the two of you want to share your thoughts on where is disruption in this industry going to come from? Uh, we, we promised we won't do arm um, wrestling here. Uh, but no, I think, um, look, we respect uh, Duolingo. There's some great innovation that has happened there. Uh, but at the same time, I think there is, uh, uh, if you look at the ecosystem, there's a place for different players based on the expertise and capability that they bring to the table. Uh, as I mentioned in, in my earlier remark, I think high stakes assessments need to evolve. Um, and it's the need to evolve is coming from the fact that the world around us is changing and changing quite rapidly. And as a result, the, the unidimensional view of a test score needs to be evolving as well. If you think about, we talked about AI, but also thinking about assessments rather than just a score being a bit more holistic. You know, there are multi dimensions to any personality and whether you are in an academic setting or in a work setting, it takes more than just your cognitive skills to be successful. I can definitely measure your critical thinking uh, or, or, or verbal reasoning, but how about you know, your interpersonal uh, behaviors like your teamwork, your collaboration, uh, or affective behaviors, you know, your growth mindset. And, and that's, that's the area where I believe you know, with our expertise that we bring to the table, decades of research, we are helping evolve this industry in the right direction so that we are presenting an individual more than in more than just a score. Um, I think that having ETS and IELTS, so the incumbents um, also moving into digital testing has been a really exciting thing to see. And at Duolingo, one of our operating principles is learners and test takers first. And I think the winners in all of this innovation that's happening right now in testing are the students and because they have more options. 
And that's a great thing. And you know, we're seeing people in places in India, fourth, fifth tier cities that didn't have access to tests through TOEFL products, through Duolingo products, through IELTS indicator, now having options to take tests that didn't before. So it's great to see students winning. I think uh, the other point, uh, Alan, is about the, the purpose of education and the purpose of assessment, therefore. I think one of the important points, the point which in a time in the last couple of days, we are seeing that there is a discussion of learning to learn, lifelong learning, the, the whole idea of doing courses one after the other to continue building your skill. I think we are collectively as an assessment provider, also as a follow-up uh, courses providers, are the important for us to recognize that how do we kind of make ourselves absolutely curated around that to be able to enable our learners to get that lifelong learning journey uh, fulfilled. So I think it's important that we you should use a digital in a sense and to get that choice captured uh, and make sure that it doesn't really remain a discrete uh, a fail and pass uh, story or yes and no story. It is more sort of spectrum uh, and therefore it helps you in terms of continue building your skills uh, as you get into a 21st century. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, so on our platform, as I said, that uh, we get a huge number of exams and let's say these people are applying for various jobs and then giving exams and some of them get selected, let's say, let's say one percent and then giving another exam. So, uh, one of the things uh, which we do and which we want to focus on is uh, whether we are able to give the right guidance to our learner and that is basically based on uh, assessment of uh, somebody's strengths and weaknesses. So as soon as somebody is on our platform and they, they are interacting with the platform and giving uh, a small, small assessment test, we, we are able to figure out that, okay, this, this, this person will be able to do this or not. And eventually, uh, uh, if, because otherwise, if you look at the uh, state of education and let's say you want to think of villages and towns, so this is still, there are a lot of gaps, although, uh, the whole ecosystem is working, government is working, startups are working to improve that. But uh, but in most of the cases, when these guys come up to this stage where they have to give a exam to get a job, so so there is there is a gap, and we need to guide them, tell them, and train them on that. Uh, so I think this this uh, the the aspect with Ratnesh highlighted that how uh, as a uh, assessment provider or test pair provider we are able to guide and navigate any user and train him in the right uh, direction, uh, right thing, so that he can be successful, he can get a job, he can, he can achieve what, what he intends to achieve. And if there are like, uh, uh, somebody is thinking of a certain thing, and we know that, no, no, he, this guy will not be able to do, and we, how we stop that, uh, that, I think that also matters. We're coming down to the last five minutes of the panel, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists to respond with a few thoughts that they want to leave you on about like where they really think the future of all this is going. But I'm going to ask you to respond to that in the form of kind of an investment question. Uh, you know, so let's say GSV is handing each of you $10 million check. <laughs> Sorry, GSV. <laughs> uh, what would you choose to invest in with that money today in order to pay off tomorrow? I'll start. I'll start. Uh, I'd, I'd like to invest in all of my panelist companies. <laughs> That's a start. But I think um, as we think about um, where the future lies, I think in many cases, um, uh, not all, assessments, as an example, has been, uh, especially in the Indian context, uh, has been uh, a way to eliminate and narrow the playing field. Right, and we have all been in that uh, part of that ecosystem, and I think it needs to mature and evolve to be more of selection. And while it may, on paper, mean the same thing at a high level, it means different things when you think about what an assessment provides. When you're selecting, you're also looking at key your you're hopefully in a position where you're also able to give feedback. And that means investing in capabilities that can give insights into skill sets that you have that may or may not be meeting the requirements of the particular role or institution that you are applying to, but leaves you 
with feeling enriched from the experience that I'm walking away knowing a bit more about myself than I did coming in. And as a result, being able to apply, whether it's in a professional setting, whether it's in an academic setting, uh, to things that can help in the lifelong journey, as you mentioned, lifelong learning, continuous professional development, and as a result, helps you become a better individual. And, and what we believe is, you know, realize and uh, un unleash the potential that is within each one of us. So those are the capabilities in which I'd like to invest. So I'll take on Rohit, and uh, if I had to be now in here, I would invest in ETS and Duolingo, make money. Uh, but if I am thinking of in terms of a longer term vision, I think I'm sure ETS and Duolingo also thinking about it, is to be able to get the context right, get the personalization right, and make a real choice-based deep assessment which is can, can actually empower the larger uh, seven billion set of large part of that several billion, billion people uh, who would be clearly lies in this part of the world in Asia and then make sure that we empower them to get their lifelong learning through that personalization very easy and simple. I know what do you want to invest in. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the biggest gap lies uh, at a stage where uh, we are able to tell our educator or learner uh, the right direction. The other side is that how we ensure that uh, our uh, Education is effective. So probably I would like to work with the government where I work on both these aspects and uh, somehow uh, we, we develop those processing systems where we are able to identify strengths and weaknesses uh, of any kid, give the right feedback, and probably give them that direction in terms of their learning and career. I think that, that will be something. Jen, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, 10 years ago, we bet on mobile for language learning, and I think that was a good bet. Um, and I think if we're making a bet now, it's probably how AI is gonna drive forward assessments um, and empower, as Ratnesh said, so many people in the world. Um, you know, it's, I'm sure we've all thought this in the last three years with a global health crisis and climate change and ideological radicalization that like half of the world's talent is not available to be helping solve these problems because they can't access education and then they can't access assessments to prove that they've had education. And so the way that we can we can mobilize both of those things, I think is really gonna be through AI um, because it helps scale. Thank you all. I mean, none of you picked easy choices. We're investing in insights, context, and capabilities, and personalization, which uh, I think shows there's a lot of room for opportunity, and yet also a lot of really unique challenges ahead. So thank you all to my esteemed panelists. Thank you, thank thank you, you. so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you for those suggestions, the investing suggestions as well.